for Dave. Okay, so we are very excited to have Nicole Stocker with us today. Uh, Nicole is a museum educator with the Bonner Heritage Farm, um, which is part of the Lake County Forest Preserve. At the farm, she develops programs and she plans and maintains a large scale, a large -scale garden each summer. Um, she also develops programs for the Lake County Discovery Museum and the Adlai Stevenson to Historical Home. She's just a real asset to the Lake County Forest Preserve, and we're really excited to have her with us today. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Nicole, and when she does, I'm going to turn off my camera and my microphone, but I am still available by the chat. So welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much, um, and welcome everyone to the program. Thank you for participating today. As you can see, I am broadcasting to you from my house. Um, and just like you, uh, the Dunn Museum has been closed. And um, so I have been home too. So I'd like to welcome you to my house and also thank you for inviting me into yours today. Um, we are gonna be talking about gardening and we'll start with um, a little background. And then I will take you out to um, my porch where I will be showing um, where I am planting right now because I actually live in an apartment. So I'm going to be showing you how to actually grow vegetables on your porch, but we'll also talk about some key tips if you do have a yard and are able to grow into the ground. Um, so I'd like to start today though with just checking in with ourselves. Um, gardening is a great physical but also mental health activity. And if you'd just like to join me for a moment in touching base and you can put one hand on your chest. You can take one hand and put it on your lower back. So you're sitting up nice and tall. Just take a couple breaths in and out. So in and out and in and out. And it's nice to just touch base for a second with ourselves too. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Dunn Museum today in Libertyville does sit on what is traditionally considered Potawatomi lands and the gardens that we will mostly be planting if you live with in this area um, will also be grown on Potawatomi traditional lands. So I want to acknowledge that piece of our history and also our current world. Um, so for today, um, I am a museum educator with the Best Bauer Dunn Museum and that is part of the Lake County Forest Preserve District. And part of my role also involves programming at several historic sites, including Bonner Heritage Farm in Lindenhurst. And if you haven't been there before, it is a site that you can visit. Um, right now, during the current situation, we do request you keep social distancing if you are going to go to that site. Um, but it is open every day like other forest preserve sites to walk around. And I'm going to share my screen here so that we can, can see that. Um, this is actually one of my favorite photos from the Dunn Museum's collection. Um, this is actually uh, one of the Bonner family um, who is nicknamed Shorty Bonner at age two on the family farm. And I just love this picture with his uh, expression and his little wheelbarrow. Um, but he is actually the member of the Bonner family who helped to donate the site to the Lake County Forest Preserves as well. Um, and you can see some of the barns behind him and some of the different animals that they had at that point. Um, but Bonner Heritage Farm goes back to the 1800s. It is actually one of the oldest farms still standing in Lake County. And it was started by William Bonner and his wife, Margaret Gordon Bonner. And they first emigrated here from Scotland in the 1840s. And in 1840, they actually moved to Summers, Wisconsin, and then found a good plot of land in what is now Lindenhurst in 1842 and purchased land on that spot to start their family farm. Um, the Bonners chose that farm for, quote, a good supply of trees, as William Bonner would state. He was a carpenter as well as a farmer. And so many of the buildings that are standing at Bonner Farm today were actually built by him. And here you can see two images of Bonner Farm over time. Um, this family farm grew from what we call a subsistence farm, where they're just growing food for themselves, to a larger dairy operation and then a larger granary operation. Um, and here in the pictures, if you look in the center, if you can see my cursor, this large barn is considered the Great Barn. And that is from 1848. 
and today is one of the largest uh, or oldest great barns in Lake County. Um, you can also see a lot of buildings that were added over time. The Bonner family owned this land for four different generations who worked it as a farm. And in the, the 1990s, uh, they decided to donate part of the land to the Lake County Forest Preserves and eight acres today and the original buildings that remain are part of the Lake County Forest Preserve. Um, if you go to the site, there are different barns, but there are also two houses, one that belonged to William Bonner that he built um, and another that belonged to his brother, which he also helped to build. So those are really neat to see today. So today, this is a view of Bonner Farm, and I do help to operate a garden at that site. Um, currently, we do not have the garden going this year either, just like the library. Um, we're not sure if we'll be able to plant up there. So I am currently planting things at home, uh, like many of you, and seeing uh, how that works out. And with our garden there, though, it is a pretty large garden, and we have grown a variety of different vegetables and plants and herbs. Um, and we try to make this garden an organic garden. So I'll be talking about some of those steps that you can take at home as well. So thinking about farms and gardens, um, many of you are probably starting yours at home. You can do a garden in the ground. You can also do some other types of gardening, which we'll cover today, including planting on your porch. Um, but there's lots of styles of gardens to check out and see which one might work best for you. But in terms of our gardens, plants need certain things to grow, just like we do. Um, and of course, those three things are sun, water, air, um, but also really good soil. And to ensure that we have good soil that's filled with nutrients, there are some steps that we can take too, especially with an organic garden. So thinking about our food, a lot of us do not produce our own food in the United States um, and are not involved in food production. And much of our food in the global food economy comes to us from other parts of the country and around the world. Sometimes with this, that can lead to food waste or food contamination with this mass production of food. Um, and today there are a lot of ways that we can ensure that we know where our food comes from and that it's healthy for us as well as for the planet. So some steps you could take could be to be shopping at farmer's markets in your local area or checking the produce that you are buying from the grocery store if you can. I know that's a little more difficult right now, um, but to try to see where your food comes from. And growing gardens at home is another way to do this. And probably a lot of you have heard the term modern victory garden, which is also the name of our program today. And that actually harkens back to victory gardens that were part of promotional campaign during World War II. Um, due to the war, different stages of food production and transport were interrupted for the war efforts. And people were encouraged to grow gardens at home to help with filling those gaps left by uh, the void in production, and also as part of a morale booster to help um, with their own community and area. And this is not the first time that was done either. Uh, Victory Gardens were in part modeled after Liberty Gardens during World War I, um, and there were even efforts before that in the 1800s, um, and as well as during the Great Depression. So food shortages in the United States has been an issue even before COVID-19. But especially right now, if you are able to donate some of your produce that you grow to a local food bank, um, that's a wonderful way to help out and help your community right now. So thinking through some of our plants, um, one of the things that's impacted here too is pollinators. And we're often familiar with these two pollinators, right? Butterflies as well as bees. Um, but a lot of our pollinators today are being impacted too by harsh chemicals that we use on uh, crops and also our yards um, and also just lack of space. And so we can encourage the pollinators that we need for our gardens by growing certain things and by limiting what kind of materials we add to our gardens today too. 
Um, some, in case you didn't know, some other types of pollinators though are birds, bats, and some small mammals even. So there's lots of um, bugs and animals that are good for your garden, as well as some bugs and maybe some animals that might be harmful to your garden as well. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, but it's interesting to note that one in every three bites of food that we eat come to us because of pollinators and their efforts. So pollinators have a huge impact on the food that we eat, as well as the um, land that we're um, surrounding ourselves with. So good for the environment and good for us. Now, some ways to attract some pollinators um, would be that butterflies like milkweed and certain plants. So you could plant some of those around your garden or in it. Um, to help attract those. Native plants are especially good for pollinators. So the Lake County Forest Preserves recently had a native plant sale virtually. Um, if some of you were able to participate, that's wonderful. If not, you can check your local nurseries to find other native plants to be able to put in your gardens. Um, another neat thing that um, I've come across has to do with, um, we'll come I'll come back to it. Um, but bee hotels, and that might sound like an interesting concept. I think I put it towards the end of the slide. But you can actually build um, containers near your garden that will attract certain animals. So um, bees are very um, impacted right now by our current world and chemicals that we use. And so to encourage them to your garden too, um, bee hotels are a neat way that you can either purchase one or build one yourselves. And there's lots of instructions online and in books on how to do that. So with organic gardening, this also helps to encourage pollinators and healthy plants for ourselves and for um, the earth. And this is actually a photo of my hand and Bonner Farm Garden uh, last year. This is one of the carrots that I grew in the garden. Um, for those of you who might not know, there are purple varieties of carrots. Um, I was talking with kids earlier today about this, but it's fun to grow um, things that we're not used to seeing too. And one year at Bonner Farm, I actually did an entirely purple garden, which was really fun to grow and to see the results of. Um, if you can't tell, purple is one of my favorite colors, but um, you could theme your garden too if you'd like, and that's actually a fun way to encourage the whole family maybe to participate and maybe encourage some of us, both kids and adults, to eat certain vegetables or at least try them um, when we're not so used to eating those or claim we don't like them. Um, now the other part about gardening that I really like too is it is a physical activity, but it's also a mental health activity. You are taking a break from your screens when you're actually gardening, though I know you're on them right now. Um, and you're actually reconnecting with nature and being outside. You're using all of your senses. Um, and especially you can use taste once your vegetables actually turn out um, and are ready to be picked in the end. Um, but it's one of those things where a lot of hard work is involved but in the end you have something tangible for your results and that's a really great thing to see. So like I mentioned earlier with a morale booster, uh, booster of Victory Gardens, that's another part of what we're seeing with these modern Victory Gardens today is this can be a nice um, break for us from our screens, a nice chance to reconnect with nature and be outside and also to actually create something that you can see results of um, which is a nice way to touch base um, with ourselves too. So for organic gardening, um, some different steps that I like to use, and there's a lot of things that you can try, um, but for fertilizers, I actually really like Dr. Earth. It's a natural um, organic material to be able to put into your garden, um, and this works very well, but there's other things that you can use too. Um, if you are planting your garden outside in in the ground. Um, in the fall, you could take the leaves that you rake and actually put them over your garden. And as they uh, deteriorate over the winter, um, they will form a lot of nutrients into your soil. They'll attract a lot of bugs and different things that are nice for your garden too. Um, so that's a great way to make use of your leaves. Um, but you can also use other things too. If you're a coffee drinker like me, I really like my coffee. Um, <laughs> 
then you can take your coffee grounds and reuse them by planting them around your plants. Um, and especially tomatoes really like coffee grounds. Uh, you can also take eggshells and crush those up and add them to your garden. And even banana peels will help keep certain bugs away, um, which we'll talk more about in a second, but um, can also help with some, some nutrients. Um, so for our garden, those are a couple things you can do. If you are planting in the ground, you can also rotate your crops. So you make sure that you're not planting the same type of plant in the same spot every year. That depletes the soil over time. Um, and so making sure to rotate what is planted where. Um, and you can uh, purchase your seeds from local nurseries and different places too. Um, which also helps with um, getting healthy plants. But uh, here we also see an animal repellent that I like to use. So if you have deer and rabbits that like to eat your garden too, um, Bonner Farm is no exception. Uh, this is a really nice material that works um, very well actually. And I've used it for a number of years. Um, one bottle you can buy at uh, different stores and garden centers, um, but I've used maybe just a few bottles on that large farm at Bonner uh, for a whole summer. So you don't have to buy a ton of it either. And it runs about $12 a bottle usually. Um, but this material, you'll wanna make sure you know where the wind is coming from because it does contain eggs and garlic and fish. So it does have quite a scent. Um, it fades over time, but at first when you're spraying it, there is quite a scent to it. Um, so just make sure you're, you're not in the wrong way of the wind there. Um, some other things you can do, I'll come back to this, but um, some other things you can do to keep different um, animals out. Marigolds can be planted around your garden. You wanna make sure they're nice and thick. If you noticed in one of my previous slides here, um, the Bonner family actually had some planted along the side of their garden from the 1960s here that you see. Um, and that can help keep some out. But um, thinking about bugs that are helpful to your garden and bugs that are harmful, aphids are something that we often see in our gardens and they like to eat all of our plants. Um, they also leave behind a residue that can make our plants turn black. Um, but what we can do to keep those out is either using a soapy water concoction or we can actually um, plant different plants that will attract ladybugs who are actually a good bug for your garden and will eat the aphids. Um, and those are attracted to a lot of herbs. So having herbs in your garden is a great way to bring in the good bugs too. So fennel, caraway, um, those are all great ones to plant to attract ladybugs um, today too. Now these are some of the companies that I like to buy seeds from for Bonner Farm uh, because they have unique varieties and um, more of the heritage vegetables um, and they're also really great uh, companies overall. So Seed Savers Exchange has a lot of different seed varieties. They also sell equipment. Um, Gardener's Supply sells a lot of equipment that we've purchased for Bonner Farm and some of which I have um, at my house today. And um, Shumways is also a nice one for seeds and I like to get onions from them. So if you like onions, really flavorful, delicious onions um, can come from that company. So those are just a few, but also encourage you to check your local nurseries because they have lots of different varieties. Um, Didier Farms has a lot of different plants too. I picked up the same kit as you the other day and it was really great to see the variety of plants that they had a really nice site to go and pick those up. If you're growing in the garden, um, you can use different plant supports and cages, and some of these are available through those companies too. Um, you can get the square trellises or the round ones, depending on your preference. Um, I like to use the square cages for tomatoes and peppers. Um, some of the round ones I've used for peas or beans, um, but it just depends on your preference too. Um, if you are growing on your porch, I'll show you outside, but um, there's lots of different ways that you can help support your plants in pots too. We'll come back to that. Oh, and here's my slide. So the bee hotel I mentioned before, um, you can purchase these or you can actually build one yourself, but the different spacing and hole sizes there that you see attract bees um, and will keep them near your garden for a longer period of time. So I'm going to 
stop sharing my screen for just a moment. Um, and we're gonna go out and check out my garden. Um, but one thing I'd like to note too, is um, for the Bonner family, they also like to plant foods that were good keepers, they would call them. Um, plants that they could make sure that they would last longer um, in their cellars and different things. So stuff like carrots, potatoes, cabbage, and they had a lot of apple trees and we still have apple trees uh, at that site today. So in thinking about your gardens too, to make sure that you don't have a lot of food waste, you can again, if you're able, donate to a local food pantry. Um, but there's lots of different food preservation techniques that have been used for many years by different groups that you could try too. So canning um, or making different preserves and uh, pickling is a great one too. If you haven't tried pickling at home, it's not as hard as it might seem. And it's a great way to preserve different vegetables um, and not just cucumbers. You can pickle a lot of different vegetables and it's a fun thing to try with your families um, and to be able to try and taste new foods as well. Um, so what we're gonna do now is go out into my garden area, um, which is on my porch and we'll, we'll touch base with my plants and take a look at how that's going. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about planting on in pots compared to Bonner Farm and my usual um, role as planting in a garden and in the ground, which is a much different story, but also has a lot of things in common. So welcome to my porch. Um, and as you can see, I've got some flowers growing. Um, and then on the other side, I'm doing my vegetables. And I did plant a few things earlier today um, with some children watching. Um, so I have a couple plants that I'll show you. If you did get the Didier Farms package, then you probably have similar things to what I'm going to show you today. So earlier, I planted green beans in my pot here. Um, I also have sweet pepper um, and with these containers, I just purchased um, plastic pots from uh, Home Depot because that was my <laughs> quick go-to this week to be able to get these for the program. And I bought some of different sizes. And if you are planting in pots on your deck or your porch, um, the thing you want to do is make sure that you purchase a container for the size your plant is going to grow and not for the size that it currently is, right? Um, and you can kind of judge that thinking through how big the plant is going to be. So for tomatoes, I bought a big one. <laughs> and one of the things about gardening that's great too is it's trial and error, right? Sometimes you do everything you're, you think you're supposed to do. Um, and for some reason outside of your control, something won't grow. For example, tomatoes last year for me, and I heard for a lot of other people, uh, did not ripen on the vine very well and didn't get, um, didn't grow very well. And that was due to the weather that we had last summer. So um, keep that in mind too, that you know, you can keep adapting your garden. For example, if my tomato plant seems to need a larger pot, I can always go get a bigger one and dig around my plant so that I make sure I get the roots and move it to a different container. If you're growing in the ground and your seeds, you know, as they grow or your seedlings seem too close together, you can always thin them by doing the same thing, digging around to make sure you can get the roots of the plant and moving those too. So there's lots of things you can do as you go um, to, to figure this out. So, so for my garden too, this is also an experiment. I see on the side someone asked about the sun. And uh, for me, I do face east. So um, this again will be a trial. Um, this is the first time I've grown on this particular porch. Because um, usually my uh, work day involves caring for a, a large scale garden at work. So I don't always grow things myself at home um, because of that. But this year I've got um, some time to do that. So we'll see how it goes. And again, trial and error. Um, one thing I've, I have not grown on a porch that I'm going to try this year is uh, zucchini because that actually came in the packet. So I bought a bigger container um, and we're gonna see how that works, but it might just spill onto the porch and you know what, that's fine too. Um, 
But with my gardening tools out here, there's a couple things I like to use. Of course, we've got our watering can. Um, I've got dirt and I just bought potting mix from um, Miracle Bro this time. Um, I did get, you can get different size bags of the Dr. Earth. So I have a littler one. Um, I have a handy trowel that you can get from most garden centers. And then I really like um, these gloves. So I have a shorter pair and a longer pair here. Um, and what's nice about them is if you're in your garden and you need to look up something on your phone, they do have a touchpad. So um, these I just got from Home Depot, but you can find a lot of those today too. Um, so that as you go, you can find resources online, you can find books at the library too, to, um, and eBooks to be able to figure out your garden um, as you go through the summer. Um, one of the other things I really like too is this tool belt. Um, and it comes with additional pockets that you can take off or keep on. And I always wear this at Bonner Farm. It's a nice way. Um, there's even a protective pocket for your phone because this seals. Um, and I got this from um, the garden supply. Um, so then for today, I'm going to actually plant um, my tomatoes into the bigger pot to show you today. Um, when you're gardening outside too, what's nice is a lot of the plants you're going to grow will actually have instructions for spacing on the seed packet or on the little card that often comes with your plant. Um, it'll tell you about direct sunlight or if some can do pretty well in shade. And so again, going to just try this this year, even though I don't get full sun, which tomatoes prefer a lot of sun, um, we're going to see how it goes. <laughs> so, and maybe eventually I can transfer some of these into Bonner Farm um, garden. So here we've got tomato plant. That's a nice size one. So again, these are going to get pretty big. So this pot is going to work pretty well for this. Um, but for those of you who did get the kit, you also have cucumber and you have your zucchini. Um, so that's going to spread out a lot, um, probably all over my porch, which is just fine. So what I want to do is to start, I've got my pot pretty filled with dirt. And again, it's a pretty big pot, um, but I didn't fill it all the way up. And I'm going to add some of the fertilizer in. So I'm just going to take a handful of it for now. You can always add more fertilizer later um, and as you go. And part of gardening is just looking at your plants and adapting as they need. Do they need more water? Do they need more sun? More space? Space is a big part too. And if I can actually get my bag open, there we go. So this stuff is green, as you can see here. Um, and I'm just going to add a handful of it into my dirt. And I'm just going to mix it in. And again, you can keep adding this throughout the summer. So then, take my trowel. I'm going to dig out a hole. And for your potted plants, you want to make sure that that hole is deep enough for your the length of your plant. So this one isn't too deep down. And I'm going to plant both parts. Now from the container, I want to loosen it. And then gently pull it out. So here you can see I've got the root balls. And what we want to do is make sure that it doesn't become root bound in my pot. So I'm going to break them apart. I'm just going to pull gently to break those roots apart. Once I've done that, I'm going to set it in and cover it with the dirt. Now I'm going to go back later too, but I can do some right now. I can already tell it needs more. So I'm going to put some more dirt around and then water it. Now when you're watering, 
you want to make sure that your plant is uh, wet, especially right now since it's fresh to this pot, I'm going to water it probably later today a second time. And that's because the dirt I put in was also pretty dry. Um, but you want to make sure that the ground feels, you know, wet to the touch is not too dry. But you also want to make sure not to overwater. So you can judge that based on the temperature, the weather for the day, if you're um, for either your pots or your ground plants. And then kind of um, touch is also a way to to see how the dirt looks and feels um, and your plants. So what's neat about this one too, is you can also see it also has some flowers already on it. So that's really neat. Um, and hopefully we'll get some tomatoes from it. Now, I will add more dirt to this later, but as it grows, one neat thing you can do too, is I'm gonna actually hook this to the railing and try that. Um, you can use twist ties off of bread bags and other things, but I'm gonna try, I've got this um, metal uh, wire, that soft wire, and you can just cut it if you have wire cutters at home, use those, um, but I'm gonna use that to support the plant and hook it to the railing so that it actually grows up. And you can use a lot of things at home for this. Um, if you have those bread bag twist ties, you can use those. Um, if you have a ruler, you could use that as a support for your plant. Um, if you have, I'm gonna use um, some wooden chopsticks that I have in my drawer from a takeout a while ago um, to be able to stake and hold up different plants too. So you can buy a lot of these things, but um, you can also adapt and see what you have around your house that can be used as support systems. And yes, here's the fertilizer bag again. So if somebody wanted to see that. Um, and the soil I'm using again is miracle Grow potting mix. It's the yellow bag um, because I'm doing it on my porch. Um, but if you're, you know, using your gardens at home, there's lots of different soil mixes that you can purchase. So we're gonna come back inside and I will take some more questions here in a minute um, at the end of the program, but we're going to share with you a video too here from Roz. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. You're welcome. Um, okay, great. So we're going to save questions for the end because what we're going to do next is just look at another approach to gardening. Um, one of our library staff, Ron Mazzano, who works in building services, is a really passionate gardener, and he prepared this short video um, about how he gardens in his backyard using a, an approach called square foot gardening. So I'm gonna show this video, we'll watch it together, and then um, we can take questions for both Nicole and Ron um, about your, your, your gardening questions. So give me one second here and I will access the video. Oh, hang on one second, where is it now? Hang on, I had it up. Okay. Sorry, give me one second here. I thought I had it ready to go. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay. And here we go. Hi, I'm Ramazano from Vernon Area Library, and I want to talk to you about square foot gardening. This is my preferred method of gardening because it is an efficient use of your space. It is easy to maintain and yields a good crop. I follow the guidelines of Mel Bartholomew's book, All New Square Foot Gardening. The first step is to plan out your garden and prepare the soil. My square foot garden is a raised box that I purchased online and it is an eight foot by four foot for a total of 32 square feet. You can choose whatever size works best for your space. I like to use Mel's mix for the soil. This recipe can be found in his book. It is one-third peat moss, one-third vermiculite, and one-third blended compost. All of this can be purchased at any garden or home improvement store.
now you have to select which vegetables you want to plant. You will want to refer to the book for proper plant spacing. For instance, you can plant one pepper plant in a square foot, or you can plant 16 onions in a square foot. protect your garden from pesty critters, you can put up some fencing or wire around the garden. I use four posts and half inch bird screen. This will prevent rabbits and other critters from eating your crop. that's left to do is water and weed your garden and enjoy the delicious fresh vegetables. Okay. So um, I did want to mention the book that Ron mentions um, in his book about square gardening. The library has both on overdrive and cloud library. Oops, hang on a second. My video is still, um, oh God, hang on a second. <laughs> um, YouTube is still playing. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so anyhow, I want to mention that we have the book as an ebook, both in Overdrive and Cloud Library. So you can get this book this summer, even while the library is not open, you can still access it online. Um, so I'm going to do one thing. First, I'm going to invite Ron to join, join us for Q&A, but one thing I'm going to show really quickly is another option. This is a, a salad table. That's another way for um, growing your vegetables. This is actually my backyard. Um, my husband and I, my son built it for me a couple of weeks ago. And so it's just a raised vegetable garden. It's so easy to get to. There's no like bending down and there's room to grow quite a few things. And we just found the plan online and got the materials from Menard. So just wanted to show a picture of what I'm doing this summer. But let's see, so I'm gonna now invite Ron to join us. And Ron should be joining us in a second. Um, and Ron, if you could turn on your camera and your microphone, that would be great. So I think he's joining us. There we go. Hi, Ron. Hi, Hi Ross. Hi, Nicole. How are you guys doing? Good. How are Good. you? Fantastic. Good. So, um, anyhow, we're so glad you could join us today, Ron, because I know you have this real passion for gardening, and you're always giving me tips for the library, so it's awesome you're here. So, let's see. Um, I'm going to go back. I know there's some questions that are showing up, some that were started from when Nicole was talking. But one of the questions was, Nicole started, and I guess this, you and Ron can both answer this question. Should we put new soil in every year? Yeah, well, so for our garden at Bonner Farm, um, what we do is we don't put new soil in every year, but we do put nutrients in every year, meaning fertilizers or other materials um, like the Dr. Earth that I showed. Um, and that adds things back into the garden. And the other thing we do is we work with the seed nursery at Rollins Savannah to actually start our plants from seed, uh, seed to seedling. 
And when we do that, there's different um, mixtures that they use in their dirt that also helps to um, natural materials. Um, and so that helps to replenish the soil too. So you don't have to completely start over each year. It's more about adding things back to the soil than about new soil um, and attracting different bugs that will help with your soil, worms and things too. Ron, how about you? What do you do with your um, garden? I like to add a little mushroom compost every year and I add about a half an inch. And what I do is I, I'll buy a bag of mushroom compost and I'll get another bag of like regular compost or peat moss and mix it together. It's a little bit smelly, but when you mix it together, it does calm that smell down. And I put about a, a half an inch to an inch around the plant. And that pretty much does it for the year as far as having to fertilize it for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. If anyone does have uh, composting at home, we were going to start that this year at Bonner Farm and I have a compost uh, machine, but we'll see if we get to that eventually. Um, but that's a great way to add things to um, or just using again coffee grounds um, in your garden eggshells those can add different nutrients back to your soil too. Someone here is asking about banana peels. How, how do you use banana peels in the garden? How would that work? Uh, so I actually read, and I haven't tried this myself, but I did recommend it to my sister, and we'll see how her garden works. Um, she had a lot of aphids in her garden, and um, using banana peels is thought to possibly get them out of your soil and maybe um, to prevent other uh, harmful bugs from being in there. So worth a try, right? Uh, doesn't so you hurt. like chop them up and put them in or like, what do you do exactly? <laughs> yeah, I think you're just supposed to chop them up and not even very finely and just bury them next to the plants. Okay. So um, that was, there's some directions if you search for that online. Um, but yeah, that's one way supposedly, but with the aphids, you know, growing some of those herbs next to them to attract ladybugs is another um, more proven way, I think, to get it to work. So, um, Ron, what about, someone's asking about rotating plants. How regularly do you rotate the plants in your raised bed? Uh, I try to, every year, put different things, like a tomato would be in there, and the next year I would maybe switch it to a parsley or something like broccoli or whatever, or, or green onions or something different. But I do turn the soil, and it, it is eight foot by four foot, so... I am kind of mixing everything, the whole thing complete every year. So, but I still try to change it around just to get, you know, better usage. So you keep like a diagram of what you did one year and you save it so that next right. year you know what you planted. Exactly. Yes, we, we do the same exactly. thing um, every year. I make a Word doc that has my garden plan in it so I can compare it to the years before and try to move things around. So. Maybe I have zucchini and squash and cucumber on one side one year and I have rows of plants on the other and I switch them. So it's just moving, moving things around. Okay. Somebody wants to know what they could plant if they have a lot of shade. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that is a good one. That's what I'm trying on my porch here because I do get quite a bit of afternoon shade. Um, there are certain plants that really do like sun. Tomatoes are one of them, so we'll see how my plants do. Um, but I have done peppers on porches before with not a ton of sun, and that has worked. Um, beans, I think, would be another one. Um, peas actually like colder weather, so maybe they would do a little better on your porch. I did not have any luck with those last year at Bonner Farm. It became way too hot <laughs> for them. What about you, Ron? <laughs> well, I, I think green peppers uh, do pretty well, and, and cucumbers do real well. So those okay. two, I think, are, would be good in the shade. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a question about seeds that you might get from like the produce that you eat, or is it really better to purchase seeds that come in a little packet? I think it's worth trying both, especially when you are growing. If you are getting your plants this year from a local nursery, um, trying to save those seeds and replant next year, you, you can do that um, and see how they turn out. Uh, I, I don't always save seeds from Bonner Farm, but that's sometimes due to what is able to grow there and what doesn't more than, um, you know, and time trying to, 
to um, save those. But I think it's worth trying either way. Um, Ron, we have a question. Somebody wants you to repeat the mixture of your, your great soil mixture. Can you just talk about that again for a second? Yeah, what I usually do is one third peat moss, one third vermiculite, and one third composted dirt, which comes in a bag and it'll just say, and, and with the best thing to kind of change up, don't get like, say three bags of the same exact brand, kind of change it up where you would get like a uh, miracle Grow one bag and another company's, you know, mix it up so you're not using the same one because there might be different nutrients in the different uh, products. That's what I do and it works pretty well. Someone has a question about how deep the bed needs to be. Like Ron, how deep is that raised bed that you have? I think it's actually about six inches is what I That doesn't up. seem very deep, right? So but what do you think about that? Like, yeah, it's six inches is pretty much what I end up with every year. So, you know, it might be eight inches high, but you know, it does go down a couple inches just from rain and water and stuff. So. Okay. Um, someone's saying that they use banana peels and it was a great method of getting rid of pests as it decomposes, the smell usually runs them away. Um, and then someone's asking about, you mentioned, someone asked about eggshells, which Nicole, you talked about eggshells, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just another, you can crush them up and add them around different plants. Um, I haven't done that a lot myself, but it is another way to add nutrients back. Um, and sometimes the egg also keeps away some of the pests because uh, that's in that animal natural repellent that I discussed too. And a couple of people have asked about weeds. How does it, what's the best way for managing weeds in your garden? So Bonner Farm is notorious for weeds, so I might jump in right away, Ron. Um, it sometimes looks like a jungle up there. Um, and we've tried a couple different ways over the years, and especially with trying to be uh, an organic garden. One of the things we've tried in recent years that works pretty well, but is still not perfect, um, is actually buying bales of straw. And you can get that from local nurseries and putting that around the plants in your garden. Um, it does keep some of the weeds at bay, but you also have to potentially keep adding to that over the summer because um, some of it can, you know, blow away or just kind of shift down. Um, and so, but I would recommend trying that. Um, I don't recommend the personally, um, some of those cloth materials that you'll see or kind of plasticky materials. It actually adds heat to your garden and to you. And that was one of the hottest summers <laughs> I ever spent in the garden. I don't recommend that material. <laughs> we use that at the library garden. We use straw, Dude. we cover everything. It looks it funny, great. like it looks funny that your straw is covering your plant. But one thing I want to be sure, there's a distinction between straw and hay, right? So mm -hmm. hay you don't want because that actually has seeds in it. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, but quite a few nurseries around here um, do have straw bales and usually throughout the whole season, the last few years. So you can buy those. And then I think they're usually even under $15 a bale. And oh my, we have so many questions. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through a couple more here. Okay, someone wants to know, can you do anything to make your cherry tomatoes taste sweeter? <laughs> anything? No. Maybe buy a different variety. Um, <laughs> last okay. year I grew one that claimed to be a chocolate cherry tomato. I, and again, the tomatoes did not turn out. Um, so I didn't get to try that and see if it tasted any different, but Okay. Don't don't uh, put them in your refrigerator. I think. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And it just they croise in a little bit better, and you know, just on the shelf or on your uh, windowsill. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have learned to keep my cherry tomato, any tomato, on the counter, and it's so much better. Oh my gosh. Yeah. In fact, even like when you buy the cherry tomatoes now, like at the grocery store, it says on there, like, don't put me in the refrigerator, you know. <laughs> um, someone's wanting to know how do you know how often to add the eggshells or coffee grounds or whatever, like. How do you know how often to do that? I think if you have a regular kind of cycle of how often you do it, kind of like um, watering and, you know, adding just even the Dr. Earth that I've done, you can, you kind of have to figure it out as you go in one way by looking at your plants and seeing if they're kind of looking, you know, droopy or discolored. You probably need some more fertilizer on them. Um, and you can kind of add it like that, but I would also make sure to at least do it once a week. 
um, to be able to see. And it depends on the size of your garden too. You know, with Bonner Farm, it's pretty large. So depending on how long I'm at that site, I might get to one section of the garden one day and have to wait to get to the next section. Um, you, you know, and that kind of spreads it out too. Okay. Someone is asking this question about space is pretty tight. What plants pair well together so that you can have a lot of space and the plants are successful? And Ron, maybe you can talk about that, but does, don't they talk about that in square foot gardening, like how to time your gardens so that things can grow at certain times and you can get more out of it? Yes. So when one is done, so like I, I plant my, my beans, I'll plant like four beans in a square foot and I'll wait a week. And then, I, you know, I, I'll leave like 12 by 12 inch spaces open. I'll plant four plants in there by, you know, through seeds. I'll wait a week or two and plant four more. And then I'll wait another week and plant four more seeds. And then they'll come up at different times and it'll, you'll have a longer season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that book, we'll talk all about that, right? That square foot gardening book. Yeah, right? It tells well, exactly what to do. Okay. Yeah, and with um, farm, we leave at least a foot between different rows. Um, and then for, you know, spacing of hills, if you have cucumbers or squash or pumpkins, you know, some of those have directions for spacing them out, but a few feet in between. Um, and then, you know, you can try to see which ones will fit closer together. I always, it's a maneuvering kind of um, every year on that word doc to try to see how much I can fit into. <laughs> so. Um, Nicole, someone has a question. They want to know which plants from the Didier kit will need to be staked? Good question. Um, and I also just wanted to add, I saw somebody mention it before. So not just coffee grounds. I forgot to mention tea is another thing you can add. So if you want to take your used tea bags, um, most of them have a, a compostable material around them. Just make sure the staples are taken out but you can put the tea bags around your plants too. So um, to add nutrients. Um, but for the Didier farm kit, so there were, um, I, there were a couple options, I think, but the one I got had zucchini, um, cucumber, tomato, um, and like large uh, beefsteak tomatoes, um, not cherry, uh, two sweet peppers, and I think I covered them all. Um, oh, and the beans. So um, eventually as the green beans grow, they might need to be staked in the pot just depending on you know, how heavy they get. Um, I talked it out even with, um, which is great you know, when you're at one of these garden centers to talk it out um, with the people who work there um, from a social distance uh, too with our masks on, but um, cucumbers are gonna need to be staked. And we thought they would work in the pot if I grew them up so we're gonna see um, and then the tomato especially because the tomato plant is gonna get heavy and it's gonna need to have multiple stakes probably as it grows um, some type of support I'm gonna try to hook it to my railing but um, that's where the cages come in handy if you're growing in the ground um, or uh, you know improvising and using um, a ruler um, I remember my dad using some stuff like that in our house growing up uh, to help stake up and bread ties or, you know, twist ties of different kinds can help. Um, so I would say those, the zucchini is not, it's just going to spread out a lot and you want it to. So we'll just see how much of my porch gets taken up with that one. <laughs> it's going to be like, oh my, it's going to be like a May. Like it's going to be crazy. Your whole porch is going to be taken up by that zucchini, I think. I think so too. We'll see if I grow it correctly. Like a jungle, a jungle. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. um, Someone's asking if there are certain types of cucumbers or pickles that are better to plant in our climate. Do you know anything about that or? No. You run, no, this is my, well, I've grown different types before. Um, again, a lot of times when you go to different companies like um, Seed Savers or Shumway, they will actually give you some tips like that too, what kind of climates different things will grow in. Cucumbers, um, we've done many times at Bonner and more so it just kind of depends on the year and the weather we have here, whether they do well. Um, last year we didn't have any, the year before we had more than we could even count. So um, it just kind of depends. Don't take, you know, something not growing right as your fault necessarily because it might not be, it might just be the weird weather that we get in the Midwest, so. 
We have a comment here. It's not a question, but it's a comment. It's actually from one of our staff, Corey, and I wanted to share it. Um, Corey was saying that you can also blend your compostable materials in a blender and add it to soil. Every few days, she blends what's sitting on her counter composting container with a little water, and she pours it mixed she mixes it into the topsoil around the plants to form worm food and such. So she just kind of blends it, makes it fine, and then adds it to her soil. Yeah, that's a great, great tip. There's, um, you know, different size um, compost bins that you can buy too and different materials. Some sit on your home counter. Um, some can just sit on your back porch. Um, and some are really large. We have one that's the size probably of a large garbage can that we were going to be using at Bonner this year. So um, you can get them to fit your needs and your space. Then we're going to do two more questions. One is, if you plant some seeds, do you need a special preparation? Or, yeah. Well, to, to start, so for Bonner Farm every year, um, we've done a mix of planting from seed or from seedlings. And again, we work with the seed nursery at Rollins Savannah and staff there um, to help since we do have um, the different plants growing there for the forest preserves too. And it's a really nice collaboration of staff. Um, but there's certain things that around here work much better growing from a seed indoors to start. Lettuce, cabbage, eggplants all do a lot better for us if you start them indoors as a seed in April, um, usually March or April. Um, and then some stuff grows really well just in the ground. Corn, um, carrots, uh, radishes, turnips, those do really well just start in the ground for us, so. Um, and then, well, someone's asking if, if it's too late to get a kit from Didier, and it is too late for Didier because they kind of worked with us the last couple of weeks, but they still have plenty of plants there. You, they can help you pick it out. Basically, it was like a five plant starter kit. It was two tomatoes often like a green bean, a pepper, and like a zucchini or cucumber. So they can help you. So um, we were just trying to partner and kind of support a local business by partnering with them. They were still definitely lots of supply there still. And um, just the last question is someone's asking, do summer veggies and fall veggies have different needs, like different types of, do they need different nutri nutrients or fertilizers or things of that nature? Any thoughts, Ron? Um the one thing I would just point out is, you know, to leave some of those plants that need to be picked in the fall alone, as tempting as it is to check your carrots, let them go um, as long as possible so that you can, you know, ensure they're growing large. Um, and some of the other ones that are more we think of as summer, I like to keep in mind, and I, I've done this, um, I did this last year too, is, you know, lettuce and Swiss chard and kale um, are things that you can just trim and they will continue to grow throughout the summer. So you just trim at the base of the leaves and you can find instructions for how to do that online, but they will continue to grow. So rather than just pick things like that when they're ready, um, if you wanted to trim them, that's a great way to extend those summer veggies even longer. Okay. And I don't put any different nutrients, do you, Ron? No. <laughs> pretty much just let it go as long as possible. And it's pretty surprising how big a carrot would get for a mm -hmm. couple more weeks longer, yeah. Yeah, that one I showed you in the picture earlier, um, the purple carrot, I let that go into September um, of last year and, and that worked a lot better, so. Awesome. So it sounds like no matter what your container is, whether you're in the ground, whether you're doing containers or square foot gardening, it's just, the, the soil mixture is kind of the key to this whole, like this whole thing is mm -hmm. if you can get this good soil mixture in place, yeah. it sounds like yeah. that's the really important thing to focus on. Yeah. Just like anything, got to start with a good base. Yeah. yeah so I'm going to do one thing before we leave. I'm going to ask you guys another really question. I'm going to do a poll really quickly. Um, I'm going to ask you how many people are currently watching this webinar on your device? because we know we can see how many participants we have, but we know some people are maybe watching this with their families and we want to get a sense of, um, you know, we still like, we can't see your faces. We want to be able to know like how, um, how many people are watching. So we had a really wonderful turnout for this program. We're super excited about that. Um, so we just, um, 
I'm just gonna let that go for one second and have everybody give a chance to answer. Okay. Um, okay. So I think we're gonna close that poll now. Okay. Um, okay, well anyhow, I think we're gonna wrap this up, wrap up this program, but Ron and Nicole, thank you so much for sharing thank your experiences you so with us. us. Thank you, Nicole. Hope yeah, <laughs> it was terrific. We have some lots of nice comments coming into the chat saying how helpful this has been and thank you. And they people, our patrons are just amazing and they've been so grateful and really um, been wonderful during this whole online thing. <laughs> so lots of nice comments coming in about how thankful they are. So um, again, for all of you that are out, you know, that are gardening, we're going to reach out to you in a month or so and check in and we'll see how your garden's growing and maybe you can send us some pictures and we can share them. So, yeah, but I'll be sharing pictures too of my garden with you guys. So, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs>